to me the most important passage of scripture is this to know God aright is life eternal that to me is the key to the scriptures I believe that from Genesis to Revelation it is trying to tell us what God is, how to reach God, how to pray to God, how to make preparation for prayer. And I think that what Moses and Jesus were telling us is that they discovered God and that they are revealing to us that which has been revealed to them. Now Moses, uh, well, actually or symbolically, received it on a mountaintop we can well believe that he was on a mountaintop of spiritual consciousness because you can't receive such a revelation uh, when you're fooling around with the things of the world. Uh, In Revelation, many years ago, it was told me the whole history of Jesus Christ. And I have been giving it to my students without any proof. I'm now happy to say that every bit that I've told them has been proved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I told them that while the church hadn't discovered how Jesus got his ordination, I could tell them that he got it from the Essenes. That his teaching was not original with him, that it was the Essene teaching in its fullness. And that he violated the laws of the Essene movement by making them public, going to the public with them, instead of, as they were teaching, keep it locked up here in the monastery where nobody will find out about it. And that he was crucified for telling the Essenic truth. Of course, today we know from all of the translations that have come through that this is where his teaching came from, this is what he gave to the world, and some of those that surrounded him also came of the same school, like John the Baptist. Well, the Essenes were, of course in disrepute with the other two Hebrew sects. And uh, that is why they were driven out into the hills, to be alone, because they were not respected, so forth and so on. And eventually they deserved what happened to them, because, as you have brought out, uh, eventually you get the wrong idea, and they got the idea that they own truth. And only they owned it, and they could choose who to give it to, and how many years to make you wait before you were deserving of it. And you see, the moment you do that, you lose it. And then they went on and got fanatical that you had to eat vegetables, and you weren't allowed to have money, and as if God cared, tuck and tape and eat what you eat, or uh, whether you're living in wealth, or whether you're living in poverty, as long as you're living in accord with spiritual laws. Now, The reason that this is important, of utmost importance to me, is that certainly there has been a separation between God and man, or man would not be in his present difficulties and the difficulties that we have known from the Middle Ages on up to the present day. So if we do not become acquainted with God, All we have is ignorance. Now, this is the way it gradually unfolded. Every idea of God that I may have is wrong. Firstly, because it's only an idea of God and it isn't God. Any concept of God that I may entertain must be wrong because it's a concept and it's my concept And what can my concepts be based on if not my own ignorance and limitation? Or somebody's imposed beliefs. Therefore, I will not accept anybody's concept of God or anybody's belief of God. That God is, I know. That that has never been a question in my mind. But what is God? Where is God? How is God? Ah, those are the questions. Now, if I say that God is Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ is God, well, I'm certainly finitizing it down into a human form and then I'm throwing all the rest of the world out and saying, you poor beggars, you can't come into God's kingdom. 
if uh, I think of God as that old Hebraic figure of the man with a big book that keeps weighing your good and your evil that's only a concept I don't care whether my ancestors formed that concept or whether I made it up in my own mind it can't be God because how could infinite God fit into my limited concept that can't be God and uh, God is spirit you don't know what spirit is any more than I do God is love you don't know any more what love is than I do our human sense of love is not God do we have any higher concept of God than that do we know anything about love that hasn't to do with our relationships with mankind whether it's at the marital level the parent child level the neighbor level it's all our human level of or sense of love that can't be God either what is divine love you have no answer what is soul you can't have an answer you know that we have soul it may be that each one has a soul I doubt it but soul is the reality of each man each man has a soul in the sense that he has the same soul no but I don't know what soul is so what uh, again it's a concept if we say that God is truth that's another concept because we don't know what truth means and as a matter of fact we get into serious trouble when we turn to the master because he says I am truth now you've either got to accept a man as God or you've got to say no truth has a different meaning than what we think of it <clears throat> so it is that eventually I came to an experience it was a problem a very great problem not my own one of my patients one that seemed insoluble and so I sat in my office and I thought but there is a God so there is a solution there is no such thing as an incurable disease there is no such thing as uh, an unsolvable problem it's only unsolvable in our present ignorance like there are still some incurable diseases medically that doesn't mean they're incurable it just means that at the moment materia medica hasn't struck the cure but tomorrow they may and then it's no longer incurable so it is only incurable to their ignorant sense of it at the moment so it is there cannot be a problem that God cannot solve why why can I reach God why why isn't God doing something about this and then you start to think about all the things that God is and finally out of the blue it struck me this is ridiculous God is none of these things God is not mind God is not life God is not soul God is not spirit because if God were those things why right now we have God and we have harmony but I have mind life truth love soul spirit and I don't have harmony <coughs> and so I allowed a parade to go through my mind God is love nothing happens well I guess that's only a concept maybe it was John's concept and I've accepted it God is truth I don't know who put that in the book but whoever did maybe that's their concept I don't know what it means so I went through every synonym for God that I could possibly think of and each one as I came to it I declared it to be a concept and not God and the further I went the further I realized that no matter what word I used it was a word in my mind so ultimately I said is a word in my mind God is a word in anybody's mind God and the answer must be no only God is God and God cannot be finitized into a name or description or analysis only God is and then came this there is a word that is not a word in my mind that word is I 
I is not a word in my mind. I is my being. I is my identity. It is not a word I'm thinking of. As a matter of fact, it is the thinker. Not the thought. Ah, then, regardless of any thought of God, it can't be God, because greater than any thought is the thinker. Is there anything greater than the thinker? Isn't the source of thought the creator of thought? Aha, uh -huh. then somewhere in the word I lies the secret of God. Now we go back to Moses, and he says, I am that I am, and we go back to Jesus, and he says, I am that I am, and I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the bread, and the meat, and the wine, and the water, and I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, and I will be with thee to the end of the world, and be not afraid, it is I. Why, it's so plain, the secret of God is in the word I. Well, you know, I made a tremendous advance that day into the discernment of the secret. But as the years went on, that word I began to define itself. And I saw that it was really synonymous with consciousness. Because regardless of what I am, I must be consciousness. That must be the identity of I, is consciousness. Take consciousness away, and is there an I? Take consciousness away, and is there an awareness? Take consciousness away, and is there a form? Because all the form there is, is really consciousness formed. If you think of beauty, is that anything but consciousness formed as your idea of beauty? If you think of truth, isn't it your consciousness of truth that you are showing forth to the world? If it is love, isn't it your consciousness of love that you are showing forth to the world? So that love, life, truth, these are the forms of consciousness. And the more illumined an individual is spiritually, the higher love, truth, and life they are going to give expression to. So that... <clears throat> Eventually, my big word, and it is alongside the word I, it is the biggest word in the infinite way, consciousness. And then, in one of my classes, this came out. Not consciously directed, not thought of in advance, but like you would spontaneously say something that you hadn't thought about and then wonder where that came from. God is individual consciousness. And that is the secret of the world. God is individualized as the I of you. God, that's why God has empowered you. God has given you his dominion. The I of you has all of the power of the I of God. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. God has endowed me. He says to the disciples, go not away. Remain in this city until you are endowed from on high. Until God's eye is your eye. Until God's consciousness is your consciousness. Therefore, the eye which is God is individualized as the eye which you are and which I am. In our true identity, in our spiritual identity. The consciousness which God is, I am. For it is individualized. Not a speck of it. We are not a part of God. We are the allness of God made individually manifest because you can be 100% honest and not take away from my ability to be honest. You can have 100% integrity, but it doesn't divide up anybody else's integrity. Each one can have 100%. So each one can have 100% of the immortal life of God. Each one can have a hundred percent of the spiritual nature of God. Why? Because the infinity which is God is individualized as the individual. Therefore, the place whereon I stand is holy ground. Do I make it holy or does God's presence make it holy? The answer is clear. 
if I mount up to heaven, thou art there, and if I make my bed in hell, thou art there, and if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. Why? Can you walk out of your consciousness? If you go to heaven, you wouldn't even know that you're going or that you're there without your consciousness. If you're going to hell, you couldn't go without being consciously aware of it. You must have your consciousness. You are inseparable and indivisible from your consciousness. And God constitutes your consciousness. The allness of God appears as the individual being. Qualities and quantities of individual beings. Therefore, the Master gives us this so clearly, don't go to holy temples, don't go to holy mountains, for God is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, we are not going to get paganistic and believe that God is in the chakras of the body or that God is in the uh, solar plexus or in the spinal cord or in this little tube up here because that's finitizing God. And yet we must admit that God is within us. So it doesn't mean our body. It means us. Then we aren't body. We are something other than body. And to illustrate this for you, <clears throat> I will give you the exercise. We only have one exercise in the whole infinite way. And I will give it to you because it not only gave me my full and complete revelation, it showed me the secret of supply and changed my whole economic structure and has enabled me to travel this world with the infinite way without any memberships or asking for contributions or anything of that kind. Now, look down at your feet. And uh, you ask yourself the question, am I down there? Or are those feet mine? That really answers the question, doesn't it? They are not you. They really are yours. My feet. And so you go up to the knees. Is this me or mine? And you go to the waist. And you go to the chest. And go on up to here. And now go on way up to the topmost hair. And now where are you? Because you aren't there. You aren't in any spot from your toenails to the topmost hair of your head. You just are not anywhere within that. Because every bit of this is yours. And so I walked along and all this unfolding, and I kept looking up and down this body, agreeing that heaven knows I wouldn't want to believe even that God was in there. But definitely we know you can't confine an infinity of God into a finite space and how could you put the son of God there if the son of God if God is the father and the son all that God is the father is the son is how could you confine that in a corporeal body then you will see that I am not in this body and then I say to myself well for heaven's sakes where am I? What am I? Who am I? And the word I hits. Oh, there it is. I am that I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the world. But that's not true of your body, is it? But it's true of I. Therefore, I am incorporeal. I am spiritual. I am omnipresent in my real identity. Ah, do you see now that we are beginning to perceive that God the Father is God the Son. And all that God the Father is, God the Son is. That is, the divine Son of you. The Son that must be raised up in you before you are 
the Son of God, a spiritual man, because as a human being you can't be that. You would be the creature, not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. You would be the creature who cannot receive the things of God. But once the Son of God is raised up in you, you are joint heir. Now, if you are joint heir to all the heavenly riches, how are you going to claim it? How are you going to possess all that you are heir to? And you'll see the only way is to close your eyes and to realize your oneness with the I that I am and then let that infinity flow. It will have its own way of appearing outwardly. You or I cannot tell how it's going to come. You see? Uh, for instance, I have done whatever was necessary to put out the infinite way books but I couldn't have put them in your possession and if I had mailed you one it would have gone on your shelf you see what I mean so I could do nothing further than publish only the father the I could go before me to make the crooked places straight and bring it into your possession or all these chaplains in the army navy and air corps who are now receiving them <clears throat> I couldn't give them to them. They'd throw them away. Say, Who is this guy? I don't have time for all the books that are sent to me through the mail. But when it comes as an activity of their own desire, see the difference? So it is. When I was given this work to do, I was told, never seek a student. Well, no, because all I would get is a lot of human beings. And most of them would throw stones at me. <clears throat> And if I tried to tell anyone, this bishop in England, that God isn't the fellow he's worshipping, that God is inseparable and indivisible from man, where man is, you know he couldn't listen to me. He wouldn't read a book I would send to him. But if some spiritual thing in him leads him to the book, ah, that's the I that I am, it is not Joel. All right, it constitutes all that Joel is, but it operates independently of human will, human desire, human effort. Now, think what it means if you can perceive that the I which is God is the I which you are. Inseparable, indivisible. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father, for I and the Father are one. I am assuming, of course, that you realize that that could not be the relationship of one man, that God couldn't operate to do something for one man and leave uh, all the rest out in the cold. I surely know that you must see that whatever God is, that's what God is to all being. There is no such thing as the Hebrews being the chosen people of God. Israel, yes, if you think of Israel as spiritually illumined, then you're not limiting it to Hebrews. Buddha, yes, if you're looking at Buddha as the word enlightened, then Buddha is the son of God. Then Christ is the son of God. Then Melchizedek is the son of God. In other words, the spiritually illumined of you is the son of God. Now, when you come into the awareness of your allness, that is when you begin to realize, aha, I can of my own self do nothing. Now, Joel, sit down and be instructed of God, because God is closer to you than breathing. In fact, God is your own consciousness. And now you are going to draw forth from your consciousness what God has stored up for you, the dominion God has given you, the grace God has given you. Many people misunderstand the word grace and lose their whole life's demonstration. They believe that grace is a favor that God does somebody. And it isn't. God's grace is incarnate in every individual, including the animals and the birds, awaiting our recognition. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Acknowledge that God has planted his dominion, his grace, his son in the midst of you then close the eyes and go within and say speak Lord thy servant hear 
This too you will see in every book of the infinite way, in every booklet, because I have learned there is no way to find God's grace out here and you do not get it by going to church or being baptized or being communed. There are too many people who have been baptized. Their sin, disease, and death is all over them and communed and everything else that they can get in ceremony and ritual. What is mine is mine by God's grace. If God's grace wasn't on earth before there was a church, there is no God. Because there were men on earth and women and children. And so if God's grace wasn't here, there is no God. But we do know that God's grace was here before Abraham was. Whether or not men availed themselves of it, ah, they lived in ignorance, just as most of the world is living in ignorance today. But the secret of the mystical revelation is that God constitutes my being. God consciousness and my consciousness are one and the same. True, my consciousness has been conditioned by human life so that some people believe they're Hebrews and some people believe they're Christians and some believe they're Buddhists and some believe they're Mohammedans, which is a state of conditioning because nobody is any of those things. Everybody is the child of God and if you wiped all those churches off the face of the earth, man would still be the child of God and he may even, unless the church wakes up, he may even have to do without church to wake up to realize it. Like in England, where only 12% of the born Church of England people go to church. Or Australia, where only 8% go to church. In other words, they have to leave the church to find their God. It shouldn't be necessary. And I know that in the future generations that won't be true. They will come to church to learn about God. Because it is inevitable now that there are ministers and priests and rabbis all over the world saying to themselves our God hasn't stood up our God isn't answering prayer and then they realize that it's because they believe they have a God now if and when you realize that the only God there is is I because that's the only thing that isn't a projected image it is the projector of all the images But it is a projector and it is not projected. Therefore, I contains the secret of God. Then when you see that I to be I must be consciousness so that I have a power of awareness so that I and consciousness are alike. Now, if I see that I then am an infinity or if I see that consciousness is an infinity and that individualizes itself as my consciousness, I do not have to go anywhere but to my consciousness. Now I turn within and say, Father, illumine me, enlighten me. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And I learn the secret of prayer. Now, <clears throat> Think of these quotations. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God is not in the whirlwind. God is in the still small voice. Now how are you going to bring God into your experience? Is it something you can say? Is it something you can think? Or is it something you must listen to to receive the word of God, to hear the still small voice? And therefore, God power is only made evident in our experience in proportion as our prayer becomes a listening attitude. Prayer is an attitude. And prayer is an altitude of consciousness. When you are so high in consciousness that your attitude is purely a speak, Lord, Thy servant heareth. I will listen for thy voice. We are in an attitude of prayer and the voice of God which is always speaking now is heard. Well, as we search further for some knowledge of God, 
because as I said in the beginning only to know God aright is life eternal because only to know God aright will make possible efficacious prayer the prayer that results in signs following in our work and this goes through all of the writings we have three words omniscience now all these three words are in scripture omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence we'll all agree that God is the all-knowing but do we agree on that when we go in prayer and tell God something what we would like and almost what day of the week we would like it on no whether it is the orthodox prayer that says God send me my daily bread meaning food and clothing and housing or oh God heal my child this is an insult in the face of God because you are at the same time declaring now God I know you don't know this but I'm telling it to you so I'm greater than omniscience that's nonsense isn't it either God is omniscience or we might as well start searching for another God but if God is omniscience we dare never go to God with a wish or a desire or a hope or a request or any attempt to influence God except that we can go to God with illumine me, enlighten me speak to me, reveal thy will to me, thy wish, thy plan but never in the sense of God heal my Mrs. Jones child not in the sense of oh God you know that these poor suffering people are good people and they ought to have food or any of the prayers that you're familiar with in church it's virtually telling God his business and accusing God of not having enough love to take care of it or maybe enough power okay? therefore the highest prayer and this is the mystical prayer the highest prayer there is it can be prefaced with some thoughts and statements on our part like in order to get quiet <clears throat> yes I and my father are one and I'm here to hear the still small voice to receive the conscious awareness of God's grace or that I may be instructed or illumined and so we may speak along that line or think along that line until we settle down into quietness and all of a sudden come to where speak Lord thy servant heareth and then you're in mystical prayer you're thinking no thoughts you're speaking no words but you are acknowledging that God is not in the problem God is in the still small voice and when you get the still small voice you've got God when he utters his voice the earth melts the earth of evil nothing real melts God's world doesn't melt just the earth which Jesus called this world my kingdom is not of this world so this world and its beliefs and concepts will melt and his kingdom will be revealed and so it is then that through the word omniscience and taking that into our preparatory period of prayer we may dwell on that and think yes God is omniscience the all knowing God knows my presence God is responsible for my presence because God is the creator of my being call no man on earth your father therefore God is the creator of my being God knows of my existence and uh, neither life nor death can separate me from the life of God or the love of God and so here I am waiting for omniscience to declare itself all right <clears throat> when we have lived with that long enough do you know that light, prayer becomes so automatic that the moment a request for anything comes you just close your eyes and open your ears <coughs> and then a deep breath comes and you say oh God's on the field you don't have to give any more thought to it <coughs> let us take the next word omnipotence now I don't know how many hymns there are to omnipotence and saying about God's omnipotence but there isn't a soul that sings it but believes it because to them omnipotence means a mighty power over the other powers but that isn't omnipotence is it omni is all <coughs> 
To know God aright means to know God as omnipotence. And that means never pray for God to do anything to anybody or to anything. Because in the realm of omnipotence, there's nothing for God to do anything to or anybody. Omnipotence is always the all and only power. What about this power of sin, disease, death, black limitation, man's inhumanity to man? Well, I will tell you the secret of it. It is only a power to those who accept it as a power and who accept God as a power over something. So you see that we don't go into prayer praying for God to destroy our enemy or praying to God to heal disease. That is the difficulty that the Episcopal Church is having with its Order of St. Luke's. The best healer they've got is the head of it, Dr. Price. And he says that he heals about 40% of the cases that come to him. But most of the healers don't even heal 20%. And you know why? They're not praying the right. They are praying to God to heal Mrs. Jones. Now, you can't for a minute believe that Mrs. God is leaving Mrs. Jones unhealed until they get ready to intercede. That can't be, can it? God can't be leaving this world in this trouble waiting for somebody to get holy and ask him to can't quite be, can it? So you discover that if you have a God of omniscience that you refrain from telling anything to or trying to influence, and if you have a God of omnipotence so that you can say, and you'll find that I have many tapes on the subject of release God. Stop looking to God to do something. God is doing it. You don't pray at night, God, have the sun come up in the morning. You don't pray in the morning, God, have the sun go down at night. You don't pray, God, have peaches on my peach trees and apples on my apple tree. No, you know that God appearing in the form of the operation of nature is governing that, isn't he? But we do take Jones, Brown, and Smith and say, God, you don't know that they're hungry or poor or sick. And so I'm begging and pleading with you to do something for them. As a matter of fact, why should God? This is one of the mistakes to me of most of church teachings. It encourages people to pray to God for something without sufficiently enlightening them that they won't get an answer un unless they change. There must be a fitness to receive the things of God. When the woman taken in adultery receives God's grace, it isn't when she's enjoying her committing adultery. It's when she is so up against it that she says, Oh Christ, ah, then the sins are forgiven thee. That is the preparation for forgiveness. Oh Christ. See? Oh, not Christ, save me from being killed. Oh, Christ, cleanse me, purify me. The thief on the cross doesn't receive God's grace because he's on the cross or because Jesus is next to him. He receives God's grace because he's reaching out for the Christ. If he reached out for the Christ and Jesus weren't there, somebody else would be. And if somebody weren't, one of the saints or sages would rise up inside of him without outside mediation. Because you cannot seriously reach out for the Christ. Not in the sense of wanting Christ to do something for you, just, oh Christ, oh Christ, meaning, oh Christ, be with me, purify me, make me worthy, do something, forgive me. You cannot seriously want that without the Christ appearing as a man, a woman, a book, a teacher, a teaching. And if none of those things are available, Jesus himself or John or somebody else it might be Buddha might be Muhammad might be anyone else will raise up in you and let you know that something is closer to you than breathing that will release you why? the spirit of God is in you 
But there is no spirit of God separate from the spirit of man. There's no spirit of God floating around in the air. <clears throat> Take this room. And of course we say because of omnipresence God fills all space. But under certain circumstances you could have rape, seduction, murder, gambling, theft, anything going on here, right? Now what becomes of your omnipresence? And the answer is this. In its absolute sense, God is omnipresence. But God is only omnipresence as the consciousness of individual being. Therefore, if there is one in this room with the consciousness of God, no evil can happen in this room. Nor especially if the others are in any wise attuned. God is not a spirit floating around in the air. God is a spirit in man. In fact, God is the spirit of man. Therefore, the only place that I can bring God power is from within myself. Within you. Draw it forth from you. Because that's where it is. It is not floating around this room. But it is in this room as the consciousness of man. Yet, without this acknowledgement and without this reliance, it doesn't function. In other words, in the, some of my deep meditations, I have actually seen the soul of man, the spirit of man, as if it were a tiny closed up bud. As I have worked with students or patients over a period of time, I can watch this opening just like a rosebud opening into a blossom and their whole nature changes because they had no access to God before they could not receive the things of God before and now they can there must be a God faculty in order to receive the things of God there must be a means of entrance into your consciousness and so the more you know about omniscience and omnipotence and realize that all of this is omnipresence You've got the secret. Where I am, God is. Where God is, I am. Up in heaven, down in hell, or in the valley of the shadow of death. Where thou art, I am. All that thou hast, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Is it true? Yes, it's true. But ye must know the truth in order for the truth to make you free. The truth will not make you free. You must know the truth for the truth to make you free and the reason is that everything comes through consciousness if you are not conscious of God's presence you haven't got it if you are not conscious of God's power you haven't got it if you aren't conscious of God's omniscience you haven't got it therefore anything that comes to you must come through your consciousness now acknowledge him in all thy ways thou shalt know the truth and the truth shall make you free then, when you begin to live in this atmosphere, now I'm speaking through you to your people whom you are counseling, when you begin to live in this atmosphere, you make way for the grace of God to flow through you. It cannot flow through you as a human being who is living the human life because Paul made that clear. There must be a fitness. Oh, turn ye and live. There must be a turning. You must be willing for your nature. Now, does the Master say this? Of course he does. It profiteth you nothing to pray for your friends. You must pray for your enemies if you would be the children of God. Well, people come to you with all their problems and they're hating, envying, jealous, bigoted, biased, and they want the grace of God to flow through them. Can't you see that it can't do that? Can God flow in any way except through love? And did not Jesus show us every exemplification of love that he meant? Love thy neighbor as thyself. 
If you say you love God whom you have not seen and you do not love man whom you have seen, you're a liar. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Inasmuch as you have not done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it unto me. How then can you be an instrument through which God can work? If the quality of your being isn't love, because love is the secret of the spiritual life, not human love. Not human love. Human love uh, tells me to send my child to college. Spiritual love says, yes, but save out some for the fellow down the street here who can't afford it and also wants to go to college. Sure, human love tells me to support my family. But spiritual love says, not with everything you've got, though. Don't forget the family down the street still struggling. Spiritual love says, the man in prison is none of my business. He got himself there. Divine love says, when I was in prison, ye comforted me. See that? The Master has shown us in the New Testament what is expected of us in order that we may be sons of God and receive the grace of God without which we are not sons of God and all the praying in the world. All the baptisms, all of the uh, communions, all of the Easter services and all the... Nothing. Now, don't think for a minute that I am decrying those Oh, no, but fit them into place. There are times when I am so inside that I must get to my knees. I'm just as holy when I'm sitting in a chair, but no, I must get to my knees. A sense of humility, I guess it is, that drives us there to show us our nothingness. Uh, when I'm out in the big cities, very often I walk in off the street into a church and I don't care which it is as long as it has an open door because I want the quiet and the peace of that sanctuary I have said in my writings to our students please don't be particular which church you go into go into any when the urge is there first place it's quiet any church will be quiet and give you a physical sense of peace but if there is a minister in that church who has been ordained of God there will be such a holy atmosphere that you'll be healed just going in and sitting there I don't care if he's a Jew or a Protestant or a Catholic or what difference does it make what he is if the spirit of the Lord God is upon him there's no Christian spirit of God or Jewish spirit of God or Mohammedan spiritual God there's only the spirit of God there is a Mohammedan uh, Muslim friend of mine, very, very good friend of mine in Cairo, so closely attuned to me, <clears throat> although he'd be shocked at my brand of religion if he could understand it, so closely attuned to me that rather than leave to his sons the uh, prayer beads that his father carried to Mecca to have blessed, he gave them to me. And a year later, <clears throat> he needed spiritual help. And he said to his wife one morning, I must go outside and pray. And he went outside, and he went to a street, leaned up against a building, and he started to pray there with his beads. And I passed that corner and saw him standing there. And he didn't even know I was within thousands of miles of Cairo. Okay. But he was going to pray and bring me there. And out of all Cairo, he brought me to that very... It was Sunday morning. I was just out for a walk. Right to the corner where he was. Do you see what I mean? So there's no Muslim spirit of God and there's no Christian spirit of God. The spirit of God is free. It's for the children of God. Everywhere. Now... For people, oh, it is true, that people can come to you and they can come to me or to any of our workers or your workers and receive some temporary blessing. You might be able to set them free from some temporary disease or some temporary fear or some temporary lack. We can too. Very often we can heal them of serious diseases. But that is only a temporary benefit that they have gained from our consciousness. 
like the woman taken in adultery to whom the master says, I forgive you, but go and sin no more. I'm giving you this dispensation, but I can tell you that it won't last beyond tomorrow unless there is a change in your consciousness. And so it is that regardless of the healings that we bring to people, they're not the important thing. The only important thing is if they stay with us long enough to have a change of consciousness. Turn ye and live. Be ye renewed through the renewing of the mind or the transformed through the renewing of the mind and so forth. Do you see? If there isn't a transformation, a conversion, all the physical healings that they can get and all the financial ones will only prove to be temporary things. And the reason is this. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now this doesn't just mean uh, that when you die and you cross over that there will be some blessings waiting for you. It means that. But it has a deeper significance than that. Every spiritual treasure that we lay up becomes a material blessing tomorrow, next year, or the year after. Inasmuch as ye visited me in prison, or inasmuch as ye comforted me, inasmuch as ye healed me, inasmuch as ye clothed me, you have laid up a spiritual treasure, especially if you've told no man about it and didn't have your name published in the paper for giving the church a contribution to build or so forth and so on. Now, oh, we take literally Jesus' teaching. Pray not to be seen of men. Do your alms not to be seen of men. Or it doesn't mean not mail a check and the secretary won't know about it or the minister, but uh, don't let your neighbor next door, don't let the papers print it if you can help it. Because the things that God seeth in secret, now let's find out what that means. I and my consciousness are one. What goes on in my consciousness determines my life. Not what you think of me or don't. Not whether you like me or don't. What affects my life is my relationship with God. My relationship with myself. And if I keep myself in the law of God, I will get my reward from God and not the adulation of men. Continuously I am receiving letters uh, saying that so-and-so is using my books and not giving me credit, and so-and-so is quoting me, and, I, and my answer is, uh, I didn't invent those things. They were a gift of God, but not to me. They were just a gift of God to spread. Why do I copyright my writings? Well, don't think I copyright them so as to have an exclusive on them, but no responsible publisher would publish them without it so they have to be copyrighted. Aside from that, I would prefer that they not be copyrighted. Earnings? I would earn more if they weren't copyrighted because the little royalties that I get would be more than made up by people's gratitude for the healing and the regeneration that they get. And as a matter of fact, my biggest source of income is the voluntary money that is sent into me. It's far, far, many times bigger than my royalties. So if there were four times more books out, <laughs> I'd have four times more earnings. Do you see that? Yes. So even from a selfish standpoint, I wish they weren't copyrighted. But from a spiritual standpoint, more so. Because any revelation that I have had, as you can see, I can back it up yes. with Jesus. And I could back it up with Buddha. And I could back it up with Nanak. See that? So that it didn't originate with me. It really just came through me. And uh, so it isn't mine. And if they don't want to mention my name, fine. In the last analysis, I explained to our students that Christ will be the only salvation of the world. Not Jesus, but Christ. The Spirit of God in man. No man or woman will save the world ever. But every man and woman from the original Krishna down who has ever lent themselves to a spiritual ministry is a step on the stairway. This world cannot be saved on the teachings of any one individual. Because they'd be locked up in a book or they'd be locked up in somebody's memory. They have to go into somebody else to carry out. Do you think? 
Many of these teachings of Jesus were in the Hebrew Testament. First commandment, the second commandment of the two great commandments, they didn't originate with him. Lean unto thine own understanding, whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Omnipresence, omniscience, it's all. And you'll find it in the Oriental Scriptures too if you just know how to look. So it is then that all these people have been contributors. But it is the activity of the Christ, the Spirit of God in man, that ultimately will save him from his uh, mortality. We will only put off mortality, not by humanly wanting to, but as the Spirit of God touches us inside and puts it away. No man can of himself be good or worthy. In uh, Australia, I was to meet a minister after his noon broadcast. He had been reading the books and wanted no more. And uh, so we listened to his noon broadcast and uh, then met him at the radio station and we went for a long afternoon drive. And the first thing he said was, I suppose you could pick my uh, remarks to pieces. And I said, no, no, no. I must say that I was in agreement with everything you said but one. And uh, evidently you have a fine ministry and are doing a great work. But there was one thing you said that I could never come into agreement with. You told them that if they choose, they could come to your church on Sunday and uh, be on the right side, as it were, and so forth and so on, receive the blessings and all this and that. And I said, uh, that I'll never agree with. I do not believe that they have that choice or that they could make that decision. Why, he said, that's the foundation of our Christian teaching. I said, then your foundation is wobbly. And just then there was a man coming down the street, rip-roaring drunk. And he was in a horrible shape. His clothing, his face, his conduct, everything. So I said, let us pull up here to the side. Now I said, sir, you have a nice church and a good family and what we call success in life. Yes. And so have I. And so I'm very happy. You're happy? Yeah. And this man is seeking happiness. And a family and prosperity? Yes. Let's call him over and tell him, come to church Sunday and get it. We've got what will give him what he's seeking. Oh, no, he said, I don't think he has the choice. Of course he hasn't got the choice. Of course he hasn't. His consciousness hasn't even got in an awareness that we exist or that we have anything. So how could he have a choice? Now I said, I can go back to my own younger days. When uh, people try to convince me of uh, going to church or doing this and that, the other thing, and I had no choice, I just couldn't go. 